Hi, hello, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this um, Q&A session. So uh, my name is um, Katarzyna Kowalczyk, for those who joined us lately, and I'm here with uh, Jim McVeigh, who's Professor in Substance Use and Associated Behaviors at the Manchester Metropolitan University, with Hannah Timson, who's a reader in Socioeconomic Engagements in Health at the Public Health Institute at Liverpool John Morris University, and Magdalena Domkowska, uh, who works over a decade in area of drug policy. Hi. Good morning, good afternoon. Hi. So our speakers are looking forward to answer your questions and we've already had some. So let me just start with the, um, with the very uh, beginning. So in all of your presentations, you address um, the issue of the importance of collaborative activities. So the, the pandemic itself showed us sort of the, the power of collaboration. So the question I have in here is, uh, what could be done to improve multi-sectoral cooperation? Because we have heard, and I think it was in your, um, your presentation, Hannah, about the, the mistrust uh, between various agents. So if I could start with you, Hannah. Yeah, so I think one of the key issues that we found is where collaboration works well, it's when it's done in a true sense and it's not at all tokenistic. So I think that's really important for a collaboration to work well. It needs to be a partnership and everybody needs to be treated as equals. Mm -hmm. So in the experiences that we've had with our research, people have had negative experiences where they haven't been valued, their voices haven't been truly heard they've been told that their voice would make a difference but then actually it doesn't and there's so many communities that we've worked with who have been told if you work with us then we'll make changes and actually nothing really happens that's long lasting so it might be a short term uh, change but the investment isn't made in the long term so i think that's probably one of my overarching key messages is that it needs to be um, a valuable, true and equal partnership. Right. Uh, Jean Magdalena? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for, for me, one of the uh, key things is around uh, stripping back uh, what you believe or, or what you go into it, what you know to be true. Uh, and being willing to listen to other people's truths and to accept the fact that with what, even with the best of intentions, when you go into any kind of relationship, probably what you want to get from it or what you think others may want to get from something isn't a reality. Mm -hmm. In reality, when you go into something around um, whether it's ar around drug treatment or drug interventions. For most people, the drugs aren't the issue. They, 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 I'm not saying they don't care about those things, but there's a lot more other things of more importance or that we would have to get through before we ever touch that issue. And it, it works either way. This, I think, is true with um, working with communities, but also with working with other partnership organisations. You know, we may feel we know what the police and what they're um, important to them is, but we're not, we don't, we don't, we don't wear their shoes. We don't know yeah. what their real primary objectives are. And I think it's stripping back what we believe we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Magdalena. Thank you. So building on what Hannah and Jim said and agreeing to everything that has been already said, um, I would say let the partnership and the collaboration be inclusive to have around the table uh, all actors who are anyhow engaged uh, in addressing the, uh, the problem. If we think about the city level, then these are usually the authorities, the decision makers, law enforcement, definitely uh, NGOs, um, outreach workers, but uh, last but definitely not least, the community members, people who are uh, affected by the uh, by the policy, or um, whose voice is quite often marginalized. Unfortunately, while we should always remember uh, that phrase, nothing about us without us, and include 
uh, everyone who's interested uh, include and listen to uh, to their voices uh, definitely. I haven't touched that in my presentation, but there's a very nice um, example of Frankfurt in Germany mm -hmm. that have uh, a long-lasting cooperation uh, of many different actors that started years ago, but uh, but that group meets each uh, week or uh, bi-weekly, uh, very, very regularly for a long, long time um, that, uh, that allows them to update um, each other and to be responsive to the changing situation. I think in nowadays world of COVID, uh, the situation is changing very rapidly and we need to adjust to whatever is uh, happening. Well, thank you for this uh, example of um, successful response to um, because this is something which is also very, very interesting and very important nowadays. And I think you've already, uh, all of you, uh, answered another question we had about the authentic voice of those affected. So, and how can this, this voice be amplified? But you tackled as well a very important issue of sustainability and uh, long-term perspective in planning. And we have a question. Uh, with regards to what you said in your presentations about uh, successful responses to uh, pandemic with regards to rough sleepers and homeless people. And the question is, um, how confident are you that those steps uh, taken to improve support for rough sleepers will continue? So, uh, Jim, Magda, Hannah. <laughs> Anyone who would be optimistic? <laughs> Oh, they are definitely the ones that should be capped and that should not be treated as one time response. Uh, but, but of course, we cannot be sure about that. This is something that we all, all the advocates need to uh, need to work. Um, my hope is that uh, COVID in a way showed or let people show a lot of compassion and solidarity. Uh, so this is something to build on and to keep it going. But, but at the same time, we all expect the austerity measures to be uh, increased. And then probably that, that will be the moment when, uh, when uh, it becomes challenging. Mm -hmm. um, Jean, would you comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, obviously uh, the steps that were, were taken in the UK over um, bringing in um, accommodation for those people who are homeless. Uh, but when you start to unpick it a bit, it was only those people who were homeless at the point of lockdown, not mm -hmm. during lockdown. Mm -hmm. So th th immediately, th I suppose it shows a, a, a lack of understanding of what that situation is. Um, another thing, there were twice as many people as they expected, which is, and I, I found it particularly interesting, uh, a few days ago when we heard about the numbers of people of homeless nationally, when we don't know how many there are locally, I, I, I don't know how they know how many there are nationally, but there's always, a, well, we know this, we've got this boxed off now, we've given the, we've given the homeless uh, somewhere to live, and then we have a prime minister who says that, you know, if it doesn't work out, why don't they go and stay with their uh, family or friends? <laughs> you know, and it's that level of sort of ignorance that makes you feel sometimes that you go one step forward and two steps back. And I know that realistically we need to take the wins where we can and hold on to them and build from there. But each time you hear it being undermined in some way, you, you feel that that, that, that is creating as, as much damage as, as many of these good things are creating good. You're, you're right. And um, Hannah, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think um, just to kind of echo what's already been said around, there's a real, um, in terms of the, the recovery response, um, particularly here, I think there's a real importance that we look at the longer term implications and that we don't just look at these are the short term solutions. This is what we need to do. Um, obviously, within the response, you know, there has been some great examples of positive action that's happened. And what we need to do is to learn from that. And I think that one of the risks is that in terms of going to recovery, 
that there'll be some decisions made that might undo some of that good work and it is about understanding what the long-term implications could be and some of that it, from an austerity perspective it's around you know that whole investor save argument you know you you sometimes might not necessarily see um you know a financial implication immediately but if you make the right decisions now in the longer term you'll get that payoff so i think it's uh yeah definitely kind of just echoing uh, what's been said already and building on the need to have long-term investments. Um, the next question is addressed to you, Hannah, directly. Uh, you seem to have had success in engaging with the grassroots communities groups, so any tips on how could it be replicated? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, for us, a lot of the research that we do um, is with people who might not necessarily access statutory organisations, and sometimes they might be um, kind of classed as hard to reach. Nobody's hard to reach. Everybody is out there. You just have to go to them. Um, and sometimes the best way that we find to do that is to work with those grassroots organisations, so third sector organisations, um, voluntary community, faith. Um, organizations and it's about making um, use of your networks building relationships establishing relationships and when you do it's about maintaining that keeping hold of that mm -hmm. not doing anything that's tokenistic and really um, you know placing value on the relationships that you build and a lot of the work that we have done with people in communities um, mm -hmm. who you know have been very isolated suffering with extreme mental health issues mm -hmm. exacerbated by poverty and the associated factors there a lot of the ways in which we get to speak to those people and find out you know what do you need how can we support you how can we ensure that inequality is not exacerbated for um, you know those populations it's going through the third sector it's going through community organizations and i think once you start to build um or you know relationships with people in networks then you you kind of it's it's such a great way to work and i think it's really important that we do place value on making sure that we invest in the infrastructure that we have in the third sector because those grassroots organizations are the ones that often are counted upon to make the difference but not necessarily always invested in um in that longer term mm -hmm. uh, and the other tips any other what sorry tips for um, I'm engaging. Mm -hmm. Jim? I mean, that would come in. And it, it, yeah. it, it, they're not my tips. They're, they're things <laughs> that I've seen Hannah do. And it's the <laughs> amount of groundwork and, the, uh, and that uh, preparation uh, uh, on, on the, the particular topic, but also how to engage with them. And then using imaginative ways to engage with them. And I know because I, I used to sign, have to sign off um, requests for, for the things that she used to purchase, including various <laughs> toys, games, whatever. And not using them in a patronising way, but using them for, to, to let people express themselves mm -hmm. or yeah. to break down barriers. And and, and I think it, it's the, what she dismisses it as it's just going out there uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and making it happen. It, there's that background work that she does, which has been so important. Mm, thank you. Um, Magda, another question is directed to you. Uh, do you think that the pandemic could be a defining moment for the future of harm reduction as the AIDS epidemic was before? Oh. Oh, that, that's a <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I'm not sure if it could be a defining moment, but definitely uh, that can be a moment when we uh, use a chance. I mean, it's also difficult to speak about the pandemic as a chance, but, but in a way it can be seen as an opportunity. Yeah. So, so uh, I do believe that this is the moment when a lot of things that, uh, that have been clear for us are actually becoming visible to the public, to the decision makers. Uh, we can see that things are possible, that they're not damaging the safety of, um, of the public, of the citizens, for example. So I do believe this is the moment that we can use, um, but, but who knows how that, will, how that will happen. I mean, there's of course a lot, a lot of work uh, that needs to be now done around that. I can see, um, I can see NGOs, organizations uh, really doing a great job here. Uh, but it's not only about delivering services right now. This is the most current, the most urgent need, and um, 
and I can see people being really innovative, thinking outside of the box. But then we, we will need to spend some time, maybe when the situation becomes a little bit stabilized, uh, to um, to monitor the change, to report, to collect the data, to, uh, as Hannah said, we need to think in the long term. So there will be a moment when uh, we will be able to use whatever we, experience, we are experiencing right now and to build upon that. But there's, of course, uh, work to be done for the advocates, for the organizations. Um, I once again would like to, um, to remind what has already been said here about the engagement of the communities, of their voices, they do need to be able to speak for themselves and advocate for, for their needs. They're the ones who know what is needed. So I would find it really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, Hannah, would you try to address this question? If, if I may, and I, and I suppose it's, I, I, I don't mean to come over to that is even too pessimistic but in many ways i hope it's not defining because my fear is that the definition would be where we saw a lot of the mm -hmm. ngos and voluntary sector decimated as a result of the um economic impact that covid may have and, and, and while i accept you know the the hardship and, and the pain of people suffering directly from covid I do. I am very concerned about what that the economic impact may have on the most vulnerable of people and the most vulnerable of organisations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, um, Hannah. Yeah, just to pick up on that, really, I think that that's definitely been the experience that we've had so far working with um, <laughs> voluntary. Uh, community faith groups and organisations is that they have adapted so quickly. They've adapted um, immediately and really effectively, but they are the ones who are now most vulnerable in terms of potentially, you know, they're going to be asked to pick up a lot of the pieces, I think, in terms of the recovery element, um, people in the community, people in the homes being supported by third sector organisations, and yet they are most vulnerable and they don't necessarily have the long term uh, resources financially, staff wise. Um, volunteer wise to be able to provide the support that I think is really needed so there is a risk there at the moment and we're doing some research at the moment to try and understand what some of the implications are for grassroots organizations in the third sector to see how their sustainability and their infrastructure might be um, potentially you know put at risk um, by the current situation. Um, this question is not on our list. It's um, it's my question, but I feel <laughs> like I, I can address it. And it's a question uh, to you, Hannah, about the results of your study, because they are um, very interesting. And I'd like to ask, uh, is there anyone, I mean, policymaker, that you use um, the results of this study, for example, for the future planning? Like, do you share these results and they are being used? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so the research that um, we presented is um, from a number of different projects that we've done across the Liverpool City region, um, but very specific to um, sort of issues around compassion and austerity. And um, what we tend to do is we're commissioned to do the research by local authority um, or health and social care organisations, so statutory organisations. And um, what it enables us to do is to then uh, bring that voice back to the table. So one of the examples that I talked about was um, a social prescribing project that we did and we actually brought the providers and the commissioners together um, to discuss the results of our research to talk about what would that mean for the future and so we we had developed recommendations independently as researchers but we found that the providers were saying the same kinds of things but hadn't necessarily discussed it and the commissioners hadn't really had a conversation with them so we did um, a bit of a kind of a session with them using some toys that Jim described before so we used Lego we started off we had you know directors of public health um, you know senior leaders in health and social care and then third sector providers and we facilitated that session and we started off with just asking them, you know, build a Lego model to tell us what you want social prescribing to look like in this area. And then we it kind of was really then quite nice and relaxed. And then we started to talk about 
the research shows this how are we going to address it what are you going to do as commissioners and um, so that then helped to build a commissioning specification that was then um, very specific to the needs but also the, the provision available within the area uh, I think this is an exam uh, excellent example of how to bridge the gap between between the research and uh, service deliverers. So thank you for it. And from what I can see, the last question is directed to Magdalena. Um, are there any examples we can look to where populist and authoritarian governments have actually favored a harm reduction approach? Not that I'm aware about. <laughs> Um, well, the the, uh, the authoritarian regimes, they um, in a way they have proven to be maybe um, better de delivering better in terms of um, in terms of fighting with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I would say that the costs of that are so huge, uh, and that was not necessarily um, in the uh, harm reduction spirit. That, uh, that that would not be the, the way I would recommend to go. Unfortunately, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, wherever the space for civil society is shrinking, um, then we'll see, uh, then we'll see A, the communities, B, the organizations uh, that deliver services and provide care to them, uh, getting more uh, vulnerable. So as Hannah said, especially the, these um, these places would need a lot of our attention. Um, so not 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 really. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, because you laughed when I was asking this question, <laughs> would you like to? Did <laughs> it was an ironic smirk? It wasn't a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And I suppose, I mean, the, 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 of, of, of the UK in the 1980s, when uh, we had the, the biggest right-wing government that we've had until the current one, um, and we made, you know, massive headway in cities like Liverpool and Manchester, um, and that was that that wasn't because of what was done by central government. It was because. Um, it's what they didn't do and what they didn't bother doing. And in some ways, the greatest favor a central government can do is leave you alone. Because the, the innovation and a lot of the progress, yet yeah, you need the funds and you need some of the infrastructure. But the big, big benefits can be gained locally. And to, in some respects, being left to get on with it can be a massive favor. Mm -hmm. Anna, any last words? <laughs> I guess, I mean, just picking up on Jim's point there, I think narrative is really important. And, and you know, we've found in a lot of our research that the discourse, the narrative, the words that are used in policies are completely not not the way that we would expect or talk in communities. And there's massive differences between what communities want and what policy says. Um, so I think that there's there's work needed there as well. Well, thank you. I think we came to an end of this session. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for participation in our City Help online conference. And I so hope to see you all next year in Warsaw. Actually, I hope to see you much earlier. <laughs> I don't wait until next year. Uh, thank you. And one last information is I would like uh, to invite all of you for our memorial lecture. Um, Alison Chesney and Eddie Kiloran Memorial Lecture delivered by Marwa Glover. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.